Peace and grace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus, and welcome to worship with the Presbyterian Church of Danville on this All Saints Day. Today we remember and give thanks for the saints of the church, those who have died and those who are living, people who by their lives have taught us what it means to be faithful. During the communion liturgy later in the service, we will read the names and ring a bell and light a candle for each member in our congregation who has died since last November the 1st. We will also offer time for you to name family and friends who have died, as well as those who have died as a result of the coronavirus pandemic or the ongoing struggle for racial justice. You may, if you would like to participate in the candle lighting, have a candle nearby and a match or a lighter, so that when we get to that part of the service, you too can be lighting a candle. Just as Jesus welcomes us all to share the feast that he has prepared, so we welcome you to worship with us this morning, no matter who you are and no matter where you are. If you are new to our worshiping community, we invite you to visit our new uh, website at presbydan.org and from there to find our Facebook page and our YouTube channel and learn more about us. We would love to connect you through one of our Zoom opportunities or add you to the list of people who receive our weekly newsletter. Um, at the end of this worship video, you will find the links um, to those places that you can check out on your own. And assuming the incident rate of the coronavirus in our area has not reached the critical level next week, we will plan to gather in person in worship in this sanctuary on November the 8th at 10 a.m. for a single service. You can expect to receive written information next week, along with a video that will show you what you can expect if you decide to join us here. Our decisions about the setup and the guidelines for social distancing and mask wearing have all been made, keeping foremost in our minds the commandment that we love one another as ourselves. We are especially grateful to Keith Ambergy, our facilities manager, John Lacey, Chair of the COVID-19 Task Force, and Patsy Trollinger, our Worship and Music Committee Chair, for their help in preparing the sanctuary for your arrival. We look forward to worshiping with those of you who will join us here in person, as well as continue to worship with those of you who join us online. In other announcements, Sean is starting a new Bible study next week on the Book of Jonah. And so please be in touch with him or the church office if you would like to be a part of that study. And if you haven't already responded to your email invitation to create an account on Realm, that's our new and improved church record keeping and communication system, I encourage you to check it out. And when you do, please update your information if it has changed and update your picture as well so that we can print a hard copy of a full directory for those who would like to have one in their hands. As a community of prayer this morning, we lift up the folks on our prayer list that you received by email on Friday, especially Bill and Dorothy Sager, who have just moved to the Willows in Harrodsburg on Tuesday, for the foster grandchild of a congregation member, that wise decisions be made in family court. For Jack and Emma Irwin, whose grandmother Nancy Foley died last week. And we rejoice with Scott Johnson in the news of his new teaching job with the Jefferson County Schools. As we enter this election week with some still preparing to go to the polls, we remember that in the Presbyterian tradition, our prayers and our votes for elected officials are acts of faith. John Calvin himself believed there was no higher calling than the call to public office. So we pray for all who hold public office, for all who will be elected, that they will strive to be worthy of this high calling. And as Christians, we remember that when we go to the polls, we are not voting for a savior or saviors. We already have a savior in Christ. And no matter who wins, we will still owe God and only God our ultimate loyalty. 
And now let us worship our sovereign God, from whose love nothing can ever separate. spoken to our hearts and touched us with your fire. We praise you, O God. For all the saints who live beside us, whose weaknesses and strengths are woven with our own. For all the saints who live beyond us, who challenge us to change the world with them. We praise you, O God. In the face of God's goodness, we recognize our failings. Hungry for God's mercy, let us tell the truth about our lives, that we might receive grace in time of need. Let us pray. God of ages, as we remember the saints who have gone before us, we are grateful for their witness and humbled by their example even though they have marked well the path of faith. We are aware that following in that way is hard for us to do. We drift and waver. We resist and rebel. Let us take a moment now to admit the ways we have failed God and each other this week. Let us say together, mind us that the saints before us were not perfect. They were forgiven. They were not righteous. They were saved by grace. We ask for that for forgiveness 
and we pray for the faith to trust in that grace through Christ our Lord. People of God, hear the good news. In Christ, we are forgiven. In Christ, we have a new life. Thanks be to God. Good morning, young disciples. Have you ever played the game Simon Says? I'm sure most of us have played it at least once. In Simon Says, the leader tells you things to do, and you have to listen closely. If the leader says, Simon says, to do something, then you would do it. But if the leader does not say, Simon says, then you don't do the motion. Now, the regular game of Simon says is tricky enough, but have you ever played it the opposite way? You have to listen even more carefully because you have to do the opposite motion from what the leader says. So for example, if Simon says, don't touch your head, then you would touch your head because you're doing the opposite motion. That makes the game even more complicated, doesn't it? Practice what you preach. What does that mean? I think it means that if you tell someone to do something, then you need to do it too. Practice what you preach means don't do the opposite thing that you say. Instead, do what you tell others that they should do. In our Bible lesson today from the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus had something to say about practicing what you preach. Jesus was talking about the teachers of the law and the Pharisees in the synagogue where people went to worship. And Jesus said that everything that they did was done so that others would see them and think that how great that they were. But they didn't do what they told other people to do. In fact, they did the opposite. What did Jesus tell us to do about teachers like these? Now you might think Jesus would say, don't listen to them, you don't have to do what they say but he didn't. Jesus said, obey these teachers and do everything they say, but do not do what they do because they do not practice what they preach. When it comes to living the Christian life, we need to make sure that we do what we say we're going to do. And here's a little poem that can help you remember that. You can know a lot of scripture and have the gift to teach, but what is more important is to practice what you preach. Let us pray together. Dear God, help us be people who do what we say so that others can see the love of Jesus in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we prepare to hear God's word, let us ask for the illumination of the Spirit. Let us pray. In your word, O God, show us heaven. By your Spirit, show us truth. Through Christ, the living word, in whom we see your face. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, 23, 1 through 12. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow but not, do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, 
for they make their phylactic probe and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have them, people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have to, one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humble, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. As we near the end of Matthew's Gospel, if we've learned nothing else, we know that for Matthew, being a disciple is not just about knowing the faith, but about living it. Anyone can claim to believe in Jesus, and many do, but following him is much harder. Throughout Matthew's Gospel, Jesus points out the hypocrisy of the religious leaders, particularly the Pharisees. They know the commandments better than anyone else, but they are far better at giving lip service to them than embodying them in their lives. And let's be honest, it's not just to some small group of religious leaders to whom Jesus speaks in this passage, but he is speaking to all of us as well. In today's encounter with the Pharisees, Jesus commends their teaching but criticizes their failure to practice what they teach. Their devotion to the teachings of the faith is obvious, but their obsession with defining and measuring every little facet of the commandments has created a set of rules so burdensome that no one can carry, him, carry them out, not even themselves. Matthew's clear that Jesus didn't come to abolish their teachings. He was a Jew himself. In last week's reading from Matthew, when he was asked about the greatest commandment, you recall that he said the first was to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and the second was like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. He made very clear that he came not to do away with the commandments, but instead to fulfill them, to embody them in his life. Today we give thanks for all the saints, those who came before us and those living among us today, and for the way they have embodied the teachings of our faith in their lives. We remember how they modeled how to love God and neighbor, nurturing and encouraging us in our own walk of faith. We lift them up as saints, not because they could recite a lot of Bible passages from memory, but because they make those Bible passages come alive by the way they lived. A colleague of mine tells the story about how a child, when asked to describe a saint, said this. A saint, the child said, looking at the stained glass windows in the church, is someone through whom the light shines. That's what saints are. God's light and love always shines through them. When I think of people whose lives radiate God's light and love, I immediately think of people like Mother Teresa, who answered the call to serve the poorest of the poor, and Martin Luther King Jr., who answered the call to fight hate with love. But I also think of people like my grandmother, whose gentle and non-judgmental ways taught me about the power of forgiveness and grace. And I think of church members I've known who've modeled a life of faithfulness for me. Jim, whose table was never too small to welcome one more person. Dale, 
who visited his wife daily after she moved into the nursing home. Margaret, who was always the first person to notice and welcome visitors in the congregation. John, who corresponded weekly with a man sentenced to life in prison. And Katie, who greeted men coming into the night shelter every Sunday night from November to March. When I think of saints, I think of the people behind the scenes, those you will find if you look, but not because they are drawing attention to themselves, whether it is by their faithful ministry of presence in the pew Sunday after Sunday, their monthly visits to homebound members, their phone calls and cards to those who are sick, or their unwavering commitment to respond with their financial support whenever a need arises. Saints are those who make God's love visible to us. I think also of those whose devotion to God came not just through the support of the church during their lives, but even after their death. And because of their generosity, we are able to continue to extend the light and love of God to our neighbors here in our own community, in other parts of the country, and around the world. Who comes to mind when you think of people through whom God's love and light shines? We honor the saints today, not because they led perfect lives, because they allowed God's light and love to shine through their lives, illuminating the ways Christ is still at work among us, making disciples and changing lives. And this should give us great hope, because the term saint is not limited to the greats of history. The New Testament refers to saints as all Christians or believers. We draw our designation as saints not from ourselves, but from the work of Christ in us. We are saints not because of what we do, but because God is at work in us. And this is what Jesus criticizes about the Pharisees. They speak of glorifying God, but they seem most interested in self-aggrandizement. They speak of orienting their entire lives toward God, but they draw everyone's eyes toward themselves. Jesus accuses them of being more interested in having the light shine on themselves than through them. They wear phylacteries, those small containers that contain verses of scripture on their arms and on their forehead and fringes on their prayer shawls to keep them mindful of the laws of God. But according to Jesus, they had turned them into fashion statements instead, not unlike some Christians today who wear a two-pound cross so big that people can't help but see them. We all know people like this, and in them, we recognize the ways when we too have allowed the light to shine on us rather than through us. So as we remember and give thanks for those through whom God's light shines, I invite you to consider how you, how we, might best embody that love in the coming days and weeks. In a time of hostility and fear and division, how can we do more than give lip service to God's love. How can we let God's love and light shine through our eyes? Amen.
Today is All Saints Day, a day on which we, individually and as a global body, give thanks to God for the saints that have lived and died before us. I find it to be a fitting day to speak to you, for just a moment, about stewardship, and, more specifically, how God's call for us to be good stewards of His world is excellently reflected by those who have gone before. Kristen and I came to Danville in 2017, knowing hardly anyone. She was a brand new center hire, and we were a couple looking for a place to be. Thankfully, through some of the people here, we found you. You welcomed us, you made us feel at ease, and you offered us a place to work and to live and to be known. You offered us a home. I find myself wondering on this All Saints Day if the people of this church that worshiped and lived together a hundred years ago had us in mind. Of course, I don't mean Kristen and I specifically. I know that the people that gave of their money and their time to help build this church probably had more specific and immediate concerns, but I still wonder if they had any ideas about how long their church would last or what it would look like in 100 years. We all have some sense of expectation when we give to something, whether it is an end we want to accomplish, a cause we want to benefit, or some person or people to help or provide for. Perhaps it's to ease local, regional, or global food insecurity. Maybe we want to chip in to the fight against addiction or substance abuse. Perhaps we want to support work that seeks to right the wrongs of racial discrimination and oppression in our communities. My point is, we all have reasons to give, and our brothers and sisters of 100 years ago did also. Not only did their gifts impact their world, their gifts impacted ours as well. Their faithfulness ensured the continuity of this body. Their efforts are our history. Their legacy is our birthright. I'm deeply thankful for that birthright. I'm deeply thankful for God's grace through Jesus and for the opportunity to be part of such a beautiful legacy and such a beautiful family. That is why I pledge and that is why I give. There's still so many needs in our world and in our community, and I hope that my efforts and gifts today and in the future can help this church be part of bringing God's kingdom. Maybe in 2120, whatever that looks like, some young couple new to Danville will come to the Presbyterian Church of Danville looking for a home and find it.
share intention, uh, communion by intention this morning. So you'll want to make sure, if you haven't already, that you have some bread or crackers or juice or water nearby uh, for when we get to that part of the service. And when we do, when you offer the bread, I invite you to say to the person who is receiving it, the bread of heaven. Likewise, when you offer the cup, say, the cup of salvation. And the person receiving will take their bread and dip it in the cup and receive their communion in that way. If you're offering elements to a child, you might say, this means God loves them. And if you're serving yourselves this morning, and especially today, remember that you are not alone, but you are surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses that have come before us. Friends, this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It's to be made ready for those who love him and those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here for a long time. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come, not because it is I that invite you. It is our Lord, and it is his will that those who want to should meet him here. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Tender, transforming God, you have invited us to gather at this table to taste the feast, the same abundant pr promises offered to our ancestors in the faith. Time and again, you've offered your grace. Even as we've stepped away, you continue to call us to be your people. You have never left us. We praise you for second, third, and fourth chances. You were ever patient and always faithful. We give thanks for this time of celebration, for the one this meal remembers, for the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so with that community of faith from every place and time, with saints and sinners, with apostles and angels, with those we know who deeply love you, we forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, Holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We remember those who have died in the past year. We celebrate their lives even as we continue to grieve. We remember Lana Sue Cleveland.
remember those who have died as a result of the coronavirus pandemic or the ongoing struggle for racial justice.
give life to the world. Send us forth, O God, in faith, in hope, and in love. People of God, servants of our eternal teacher, listen to the word of God, practice humility, give thanks for the work you have to do, offer your voice on behalf of those whose needs you know, and walk in peace with your neighbors. And may the one who sends true prophets into our world guide and keep you this day and always.